Now we come to the most important ritual that majority or most Hindus will do, and daily worship, puja. Puja means to show reverence, puja, puja, you re show reverence. It is really building up relationship with, relationship with God through adoration, through, if you like, through love, through devotion. So it is, if you like, this attempt, a symbolic attempt to build relationship with God on a routine basis, on a daily basis, saying, Lord, morning time, I must build up friendship with you again. So let me think of you, let me show you my adoration and love, and I will do it through the worship ceremony, through this devotion, puja, puja. This is how we start the puja ceremony. And how is it conducted? And as I said, the scripture, you know, we are very reasonably flexible. We say dusk and dawn are the best time. Why? Because the whole atmosphere becomes very quiet. You will notice it. Just before the sun is about to rise. Once it rises, we are up and about and, you know, things start to, all the programs start, everything. But just before the sun has come up, things are so quiet, naturally peaceful. So we say that's the best time. Also when the sun has just gone down, the whole atmosphere becomes very calm, suddenly for a short time, before again all the, you know, razzmatazz begins. But there's a little period there. So we say, catch on those periods, because there's natural stillness in the environment. We use that. So what, how would we do that? You see, in the, in the Hindu home, there will be a little shrine, or a shrine room. If you have a, you've got an extra room, say a shrine room. This is our shrine room. Mm -hmm. Take your shoes off. We go in. But if we have a shrine or a shrine room, or sometimes a little shrine in the kitchen somewhere where the granny or the mummy does the daily worship, then you have the images, the deities. Be careful. Don't call them idols. You know why? Idols is normally associated with objects. That means you are worshipping objects. And Hindus have never worshipped objects. In fact, when I did a talk at Eton, they want to catch me out, of course. So one of the youngsters said, Mr. Lakhani, but you know, you worship his uh, uh, idols. I said, my friend, let me tidy up. The Hindus doesn't go to his, you know, little shrine room or shrine or go in the temple, fold his hand and come out. He, when he comes out, you ask him, come here, what did you do just now? Did you fold your hands and say, oh, marble, I like you, oh, piece of wood, you are so lovely. Do, they don't do that. They're using objects or images to worship the infinite God. They're not worshipping objects. That's called idolatry. We use images to reach out to the infinite God and we are not apologetic about it at all. Every religion will use some objects which is sanctified, given sacred status, but they do it, do it unknowingly, we do it knowingly. That's the difference. You say, how is that? I'll show you how it is. You'll be amazed with the way we have thought out these ideas. You see, the word, Sanskrit term, in the word in Gujarati, prati, means going towards. From the term prati, we derive two extra words, pratika and pratima. Pratima means prati means going towards, pratima means an image that will lead me to God. Pratika, a symbol that will lead me to God. See, we are clear, we know what, exactly the word itself defines it as a use, if you like, a tool for us to relate to or build relationship with the infinite, a finite tool to relate to the infinite. We do it knowingly. I said, but if I go to your church and there's a wooden cross and everybody's kneeling in front of it, I say, why are you kneeling in front of a piece of wood? They say, oh no, Mr. Lakhan, this is the cross. See, you already given sacred status to an object. But we do it all the time, but we do it knowingly, and you do it unknowingly. You see, every religion that criticizes Hinduism is idolatrous, worshipping idols. Every one of them, I won't name them, do the same. They will always have some object that they are giving sacred status to. Every religion. <coughs> Think about it. I won't go into it because I don't have problems, good enough problems in the world in the name of religion. Every religion. I went to a synagogue and they said, Mr. Lakhani, that's called the Ark. I say, oh, can I touch it? Oh, no, you can't touch it. This is sacred stuff. You don't need it close to go near it. That's just a piece of wooden chest. Oh, no, it's called the ark. See, this, they give sacred status. And this is the scroll. I say, oh, can, can I look at it? No, you can't touch it. This is sacred. It's a piece of paper with scribbles on it. No, it's sacred. They, everybody does it. We do it too, but we do it knowingly. And we are not apologetic. We say, we all do it. We all use it. So using images to relate to the infinite is not something that bothers us. We are not apologetic about it. In fact, this is the example I gave again at Eton because I was a math student. I said, look, if I told you, go to the blackboard and write infinity, put an infinite there. There's no problem. So just get up quickly 
and I know most of you know bits of you know, mathematics, so if they all went up, they'll go up to the board and make a little squiggle and say, that's called infinity. I said, that's not infinity, that is number eight that had too much to drink last night. <laughs> it's toppled over. That's not infinite, that's very finite. Oh dear, see, you're doing it. Without it, you can't do your maths even. Every field we will use, in order for our mind to get around very abstract ideas, we will use symbolism. Symbolism, you know the word I use, symbolism. So here we have images of gods and goddesses that we will fall in love with. This is, if you like, our symbolic link to the infinite God. So we use those deities, those images. Now what kind of thing would happen in the shrine or the shrine room? Standard stuff, you take your shoes off first, if possible you take a bath or a shower. In the cold winter, we are struggling, you say, leave the shower alone because I catch pneumonia. <coughs> See, that gives you flexibility. But when you go in, the way you will, you know, kind of get around it is symbolically sprinkling water on yourself and on the, on the, on, in the shrine itself, on the shrine itself. You sprinkle water as a symbol of purification. Water is a universal symbol of purification used by all world religions, including Hinduism. So you see water being sprinkled on your head, purify, because we don't even get a chance to go to the, for a shower. I'm just make it fun, but you purify. You might then, what else you do? You might put a tikka. The lady asks, what, what is the significance? Now see, you put some, put your third finger, because they say that this third finger somehow is related very closely to your heart. So you use your third finger, so auspicious in a way, and you mark your forehead. Why do you mark your forehead? We said the reason why you mark your forehead is a very special reason. We say if you are successful in meditation, very few are, vast majority of people kind of, you know, touting courses on meditation, yoga, watch out, watch out. They will just give you a CD, expensive CD, that you play, and they say, now imagine you are floating in the air, and the music is running, running, nice piano music is coming, and you're going, yes, this is good stuff here, and you're doing yoga. This is not called yoga, this is called glorified daydreaming. This is no yoga. But they'll make you go, you know, you know. So this is no yoga. I tell you, this is, I get offended. Vast majority charlatans, they have no clue what yoga means or what happens when you are successful in yoga. When you are successful in yoga, something very special, very physical happens between your eyebrows. Here, this is standard. There's a stirring up here. You feel a stir here. It's very physical. In fact, they did some research in some of the universities where they say you put some probes, you know, probes, electrodes into your f f frontal lobes here and pass a little bit of electricity, a little bit, otherwise you blow your circuits here. <laughs> Just a little bit. You see sparks and you feel, wow, you feel spiritual. There's something very special with this position. So this part is very special and we know it. It's called Agna Chakra in the Hindu tradition. We know it. So what we do is we are saying we are not that successful like Swami Vivekananda. We can't close our eyes and go into deep meditation and get the stirring up here. We'll do the next best thing. We'll symbolically mark the spot. <laughs> so we color it. So this is the idea behind marking your forehead, saying, let spirituality become awakened in me, symbolically. <laughs>